Hey, uh, I want to talk to you guys this morning a little bit about genetic insights into various risky behaviors and how these risky behaviors are linked to uh, brain anatomy and to mental health. And this will actually be a nice opportunity to also talk a little bit about multivariate approaches to uh, genetic discovery and how they're actually, in a lot of ways, um, superior to uh, just studying one phenotype at a time. Um, and I'll actually start out with that. So I'll say a couple of words about multivariate approaches to GWAS. And then we'll illustrate these, uh, these ideas with uh, three related studies. The first one uh, was published earlier this year in Nature Genetics, a very large scale GWAS on risk tolerance and risky behaviors that Jonathan led. Is Jonathan here? Yeah, there he is. Okay, good. Um, study number two is a uh, work in progress. It's a natural extension of study one in a lot of ways. So it basically, it extends both the range of the phenotypes that we're looking at, it extends the sample size, and it's also a project that from the get-go uh, takes a multivariate approach. So I'll, I'll tell you about you know, how, we're, uh, how we're approaching that. And then study number three uh, is basically a pilot study that tries to bring together uh, genetic and neuroscientific insights. So the, uh, the basic idea here is that when, whenever we study behavior from a genetic perspective, if you find something, and it's biologically meaningful, then it's very likely to work somehow through the brain. But how exactly uh, is an interesting question, and we're, we're going to use some newly available data to start tabbing into that. So it's sort of a, it's a pilot project. All right. Um, so let's start out by talking a little bit about multivariate approaches to GWAS. Um, so in the last couple of years, when, whenever we, uh, we looked at the results of our studies and, and the studies of, our peop uh, of other people, one thing became really clear, and that is that uh, almost all phenotypes share some of their genetic architecture with other traits. So genetic correlations are pretty per pervasive. They're often even stronger than phenotypic uh, correlations, which is interesting in its own right. But we can leverage these genetic correlations uh, for a couple of purposes. So one of them is that we can use them to boost statistical power for genetic discovery. So for intuitively speaking, we can borrow information from a genetically correlated trait for the trait that we're actually interested in. Um, with these approaches, we can also obtain more predictive polygenic scores. But we may also do more than that. We may actually start modeling latent factors that are driving the observed genetic correlations uh, across traits. And we, may, uh, we may also characterize the specific um, uh, genetic architecture of these latent factors. And if we achieve to do that, then it may also be possible to tease apart what, uh, what is unique to a specific phenotype rather than shared for an entire spectrum of phenotypes. So there's a number of methods that have been developed in the last couple of years uh, that take a multivariate approach. I think probably the, uh, the most basic one um, was our proxy phenotype approach that we, uh, uh, that we developed in 2014 or even a little bit earlier. So there the idea was that um, there has been this very long attempt in psychology to identify the genetic architecture of IQ. But if you, if you have ever taken an IQ test, you know that it's actually it's taking a lot of time. So it's pretty costly to collect uh, phenotypic data on IQ. And as a result of that, the sample sizes that people could get uh, with genetic data and IQ uh, were not that large. So they were typically underpowered and just not much came out of these type of studies. So what we thought was, well, if we take evidence from a genetically correlated trait, such as education attainment, um, we may actually inform our, our search for genes that are likely, more likely to be uh, associated with IQ. Um, so we, uh, we basically ran a, a large-scale GWAS on education attainment, excluding all the cohorts that had uh, data on IQ. And then we, uh, we looked at the, uh, the top findings that uh, were associated with education attainment and only tested those top findings uh, for association with IQ in independent samples. And that way, we actually discovered the, uh, the first few replicable genetic associations for IQ in Europeans. Similarly, we used that approach to identify genetic markers that are linked to a depression by taking subjective well-being and neuroticism as proxies. Um, so that's a very simple approach. Um, then 
Patrick and uh, and Dan and, and colleagues they uh, uh, they really uh, um, made a huge advance in, in the field by developing MTAG, so multi-trait analysis of GWAS. So MTAG um, takes a genome-wide approach uh, to uh, exactly do that to boost statistical uh, power for for genetic discovery and also uh, get better polygenic scores. But it has a number of advantages compared to the proxy phenotype approach. One of them is that you can have overlapping samples, and it's really just it's leveraging the information from the entire genome rather than just from a few top SNPs. Um, another couple of uh, methods were developed that, um, that actually haven't get, uh, gained that much traction in the community, although they're actually pretty cool. So one of them is from, uh, from Peter Fisher's lab, a method called MT-COJO, multi-trait conditional and joint analysis. So what you can do with MT Kojo is you can you can basically, if you have two genetically correlated traits, let's say education and IQ, and you see that th their genetic correlation is not perfect, you can back out the part of the genetic architecture of a trait that is not shared with the other one. So for example, if you do an MT Kojo of educational attainment, conditional IQ, you would get a set of summary statistics that are not shared with IQ, and then you could ask, so what is it? What is the non-cognitive part of education that we're actually tapping into? What are, what are the characteristics that play a role for education that go over and beyond just having a high IQ? Okay. Um, GWIS, or genome-wide inferred statistics, uh, can actually do exactly the same thing. So you can also do these sorts of conditional analysis, but you can do something else. Um, so Let's say you, you're interested in studying a trait that uh, is a composite of various phenotypes where you don't really observe the trait that you're actually interested in in some of the cohorts, or you may not even observe it at all. But you may be able to observe some of the phenotypes that, that feed into the construct that you're interested in. Um, then with, with GWIS, you can actually characterize the genetic architecture of that uh, composite trait. So the example that they used in the paper is BMI. So BMI is basically a composite of height and weight. If you cannot observe BMI directly, you may still be able to observe height and weight. You can run GWAS on that. And you can use GWAS uh, to characterize the genetic architecture of the unobserved trait BMI. And they did that, and it works pretty well. Bill? Yeah. Just to clarify, this is a different GWAS than the one that Matt Keller mentioned, which was genome-wide interaction study. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm not even familiar with that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Good. Um, and then one of the uh, latest developments here uh, was the uh, development of uh, gen uh, genomic structural equation modeling or genomic SEM. Uh, so I'll say a couple more words about that in, in a minute. Okay, so. Uh, Brief look into, into MTech. Actually, Patrick should give this presentation, not me. But <laughs> um, so the, the purpose of MTech is to boost statistical power for genetic discovery and uh, to increase the predictive accuracy of polygenic scores. The only thing that you need are GWAS summary statistics, so no need for individual level data, which is great. Uh, and the samples can be overlapping across phenotypes. Um, and they may also be completely separate from each other. So that, you know, that, that opens up a lot of um, uh, possibilities. The assumptions underlying MTech are basically all those that are underlying bivariate LD score regression. Uh, in particular, that the GWAS results uh, should be from samples that have uh, homogeneous ancestry and that you have matching LD scores for these particular ancestries. Um, and then one of the crucial assumptions is that the genetic correlation between any pair of traits is constant across the genome. So Patrick uh, made a couple of very uh, useful pac uh, practical uh, recommendations uh, when, when he was presenting this in Boulder two years ago. Uh, so he suggested that if you use MTAC, it, it usually works best if you have traits that have a pretty strong genetic correlation with each other. And it's also uh, a good idea to have well-powered GWAS results for every trait that you're feeding into the MTech model. The worst that you can do is basically have you know, dozens of completely underpowered GWASs that you're then trying to MTech. It's just, you're gonna get a lot of false positives and not very meaningful results out of that. Do you wanna add to that, Patrick? No, that's No, great. okay, all right. <laughs> um, all right, a couple of words about genomic SEM. Um, 
So we published this in Nature Human Behavior earlier this year. And this is really led by, uh, by Elliot Tucker Drop and, uh, and Andrew Grotzinger. And uh, genomic SEM is um, sort of like it's, it's a framework for implementing various multivariate approaches to, uh, to GWAS summary statistics. Um, and the underlying idea is that you extend the, uh, basically the mathematical framework of structural equation modeling uh, to GWAS summary statistics and to model genetic uh, correlation matrices. So with genomic SEM, you can do basically all the things that you can do with MTEC and a few things in addition to that. So you can also boost statistical power for genetic discovery. You can increase the predictive accuracy of specific scores. But you may also be able to, uh, uh, to model latent factors that are responsible for the genetic correlations that you observe and also characterize the specific molecular genetic architecture of these uh, latent factors. You can also obtain conditional and trait-specific genetic signals. So you can, with, with genomic SEM, you can also mimic versions of, of GWIS um, and, uh, and of MTAC. Um, again, it just works with GWAS summary statistics. No need for individual level data. Samples can be overlapping. And, uh, and again, it's, uh, um, it's a very good idea to have well-powered GWAS for, um, for any trait that you want to put into the model. Again, the underlying assumptions are all those that go into bivariate LD score regression. Um, but then the important thing is that genomic SEM is really a statistical framework for estimating a nearly limited, limitless number of user-specified models. So you can implement things like factor analysis, principal component analysis, uh, bifactor models, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and all of these models are going to have different assumptions. And you as a user, it's your responsibility to know what these assumptions are and what they imply. Um, so you need to think carefully about how you set up your model and, uh, you know, if it makes sense and how to interpret the findings. But it's a very flexible um, uh, approach to, uh, to model GWAS summary statistics. Okay, so now let's move on to some of the empirical examples. So we start out with, uh, with this large-scale genome-wide association study on risk tolerance. Um, so this was a study in over a million people, which still is, even by today's standard, one of the largest GWAS that was ever <laughs> conducted. And um, risk tolerance uh, is probably one of these traits where either having too little or too much of it is both a problem. So too little is a problem because virtually all decisions that we make in day-to-day -day life, they are characterized by some degree of risk or uncertainty about the expected outcome. So if you're not willing or able to tolerate any risk or uncertainty, you will be basically unfunctional in day-to-day -day life. However, on the other end of the extreme, if you, uh, you know, take consistently extremely high risks, so for example, you engage in, in, uh, uh, in drug abuse, uh, in, in reckless driving, in, in really risky sexual behaviors, you expose both yourself and the people around you to, to real dangers, and both of it is obviously problematic. But in the middle, there is a lot of variation in the normal range, and it's exactly this normal range of variation that we're, uh, that we're studying in this paper. Um, a shout out to my wonderful collaborators. It was uh, over 90 on the paper, um, especially to, to Jonathan, who did an absolutely fantastic job leading that project. Uh, of course, Dan and um, Richard, who was uh, the, uh, the lead analyst on the paper, who is one of my PhD students in, uh, in Amsterdam. Okay, so the study design followed uh, a pre-registered analysis plan like we always do. And it was basically a, a three-stage study design. So the first stage was a discovery, GWAS discovery, in two very large cohorts that we meta-analyzed. So it was the UK Biobank where they had a very simple question would you describe yourself as someone who takes risks, yes or no? And then 23andMe, where they had a similarly uh, simple question, do you feel comfortable taking risk? And uh, you could answer in five categories from very comfortable to very uncomfortable. So these two cohorts together actually yielded uh, almost 940,000 individuals for GWAS discovery. So that's stage number one. Stage number two is we went out and we, uh, uh, we recruited additional cohorts that had some sort of measure of uh, self-reported uh, risk tolerance. And we found 10 additional cohorts that had such measures. We made them run GWAS, meta-analyzed it, and then ended up with a replication sample of uh, 35,000 individuals. And the third stage of the project was that we uh, ran 
six supplementary GWAS on risky traits that we assume to be genetically correlated with, uh, with risk tolerance. So we looked at adventurousness, which was measured in 23andMe, at automobile speeding propensity, self-reported in the, in the UK Biobank, the number of alcoholic drinks per week, whether people were ever a smoker or not. So that was analysis, uh, a meta-analysis of uh, the UK Biobank and the TAC Consortium. The number of lifetime sexual partners also self-reported in the UK Biobank. And then because we had individual level data on four of these risky behaviors in the UK Biobank, we also checked if there is a, a, a principal component of um, a shared variation across these four phenotypes. Turns out there was. So if you just run principal component analysis on the four risky behaviors, speeding, drinking, smoking, and number of sex partners, uh, the first principal component captured a major share of the variation, and there were positive and strong loadings from all of these uh, items on the first principal component. So then we also ran GWAS on that first principal component of the risky behaviors. They're all self-reported, yes, absolutely, yeah. Okay, so here are some results from the discovery stage. Um, so let me see. We found a lot of genome-wide significant hits here, as you can see. Um, I think it was overall 124 lead SNPs across 99 physically independent regions that we found. Um, the, the top finding here, uh, this is on chromosome 3, the CUTM2 gene. Um, so this, this one is intriguing, it's interesting, because um, CUTM2 recently popped up for a bunch of other GWASs as well. So it popped up for, for BMI, for education attainment, for information processing, for cannabis use, for alcohol use. Um, so this was just in the last one or two years that you know, a lot of evidence popped up for that gene. And there is actually not that much known about what that gene does and how it works. So there's some uh, indication that it may be involved in synapse formation and brain plasticity. Uh, but beyond that, there, there really isn't that much insights that we have in the function of that gene. Um, the second highest hit was on chromosome 7, FOXP2. So that's actually an, an all-time favorite. Uh, so that one has been known for quite a while to be involved in the development of uh, speech and language. And we also previously found it to be associated with education attainment and with IQ. And then I'm just pointing out, uh, there's another interesting one here on chromosome 18. This is the TCF4 gene, um, which is believed to play a role in uh, the development of the nervous system. Um, and one of the things that, uh, that we were able to do in this GWAS was we, uh, we could do a little bit of annotation of whether the, the SNPs that we identified were um, correlated with or uh, located in structural variations or long-range LD regions. And it actually turns out that a very large share of these uh, SNPs uh, was basically tabbing into either long-range LD regions or actual structural variants. Okay, so the, uh, the replication stage, uh, like I said, it was this meta-analysis of, uh, of 10 cohorts. And the genetic correlation between discovery and replication cohorts was uh, high, um, 0.83, so not perfect, but definitely high. Uh, from the 123 available lead SNPs in the replication sample, 94 had a concordant sign and 23 were significant at the 5% level. Both of that is more than you would expect by chance. And uh, then we calculated the theoretically expected replication record taking into account that we had limited statistical power for replication, but also that the effect sizes from the discovery stage were inflated by, uh, by the statistical winner's curse. So taking both of these things into account, we could then calculate the theoretically expected replication record under the hypothesis that all associations are true. And it turns out that this theoretical expectation matched the uh, empirically observed rec uh, replication record pretty well. Um, of course, we looked at whether LD score regression uh, indicated uh, problems with population stratification. That was not the case. So the, the largest observed intercept that we found was uh, 1.05 for adventurousness. Um, we did something else, which was a bit of a luxury. So we, we did uh, within family at GWAS in roughly 30,000 siblings in the uh, Swedish Twin Registry and the UK Biobank. And of course, you, you guys talked about this quite likely. So uh, within family analysis, they're robust to population stratification. So then we compared the effect size magnitudes and the signs uh, between uh, of the within family sample with the population sample. 
and we found uh, that they were in great concordance. So that doesn't say that there isn't population structure driving these results or you know, that there is, that we may very well be picking up some subtle types of population structure with these results, but it also suggests that the results are not entirely driven by, by population structure. Um, so I don't think that we've done that, but I think in principle it, it should be possible to do that. Did, did you guys think about doing that at some point, how to do that? So the question was, but by, by comparing the effect sizes that you're estimating within families and between families, if you could get a sense for the presence of um, population structure or um, oh, uh, or genetic nurture, so to which extent the population... Yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly. So I, I don't think that, that, we, uh, that we can actually prove that it's zero, yeah. right? So I mean, yeah, we cannot reject that it's zero. Okay, um, so one thing we, we did with these GWAS results is we, uh, we tried to do a, a systematic comparison of what we found in our GWAS with what the previous literature has found uh, or has investigated in terms of biological pathways that are associated with risky behaviors. So we did a, a comprehensive literature review of articles that studied risky behaviors. Uh, we found 120, uh, 132 relevant articles that there were both, uh, so there were Canada gene studies, animal models, pharmaceutical interventions, biochemical and tissue assays, and there were also some studies using proxies for biology, such as the infamous uh, 2D, 4D ratio. Um, and across these, uh, uh, so across these over 100 articles, there were five major biological pathways that emerged that had been previously studied. So it was dopamine, serotonin, testosterone, estrogen, and gluti uh, glutecocorticoids. And when we apply, so we, first of all, none of the candidate genes that we, uh, um, uh, you know, that were included in our uh, GWAS actually showed any sign of association with uh, with risky behaviors. Um, then we used a comparative gene set analysis uh, using MAGMA, which is actually more powerful than just looking at individual SNPs, and also that analysis didn't find uh, support for any of these five pathways. Um, so the only support that we find is for the involvement of DRD2 in, uh, uh, in alcoholic drinks per week. So to be absolutely clear here, so um, we're not saying that these five pathways do not influence risky behaviors. It's just that our evidence uh, pretty strongly suggests that the candidate gene approach to, uh, to testing these pathways was for whatever reason not working. 
Okay, so then there were these um, supplementary GWAS that we ran, and we found in total 655 conditional independent loci across the seven phenotypes, and 46 of 99 general risk loci contained at least one SNP from one of the other GWAS, which is actually much more than expected by chance. Um, and there were several long-range LD regions and inversions that were associated literally with all seven phenotypes that we studied, including an inversion on chromato uh, chromosome 18, which included the uh, TFC4 gene that I, um, that I pointed out earlier. So one of the interesting things here is, um, so I'm going to come back to that later. So this is the GWAS here for the first principal component of the, of the risky behaviors. And that GWAS, although you know, it was one of the smallest GWAS samples we had overall, with around 300,000 observations or so, it also found 106 lead SNPs. So you know, we, we definitely were also able to identify uh, genetic variants that are associated with uh, risky behaviors across various domains. Um, the genetic correlations between our primary phenotype risk tolerance and these uh, supplementary uh, phenotypes, they were all positive and, uh, and significant. So the strongest one that we found was actually between risk tolerance and adventurousness. So that was a, in the range of 0.8 or something like that. Um, it was always greater than one, uh, 0 0.25 with the other traits. Um, so with automobile speeding, propensity, drinks per week, smoking, number of sexual partners, and also the, the first principal component. And then we looked at other domains, uh, whether they're genetically associated with risk tolerance, and we found um, definitely some genetic overlap of risk tolerance with some dimension of, uh, of personality, such as um, conscientiousness, extraversion, and neuroticism. Uh, Interesting, we, we found a pretty strong genetic correlation with, uh, with self-employment. Um, and we did find some moderate uh, genetic overlap with several neuropsychiatric disorders, including ADHD, anxiety disorder, bipolar uh, disorder, and schizophrenia. So here's an example of uh, the, uh, the advantages that you have if you use a multivariate approach to genetic discovery. So uh, here are the results from an MTEC analysis that was uh, pooling the various phenotypes that we had into, uh, into an MTEC analysis to basically boost the, st uh, the statistical power for, for general risk tolerance. And you clearly see that the MTEC results, so the, the, um, um, the QQ plot uh, takes off much earlier, so there's much stronger signal. And the number of uh, lead SNPs actually increases from 124 to 312. Okay, and then the polygenic scores. So we, we tested whether these polygenic scores are associated not only with the primary phenotype that we're interested in, but also with a range of other phenotypes uh, that had been suggested uh, both in the, in the previous literature and by the genetic correlations that we found. So if you just try to predict um, general risk tolerance out of sample, we find that the polygenic score captures something like between one to, uh, to 1.5, even up to 2%. It captures also some of the variation of um, risky behaviors across various domains, such as financial risk tolerance or, uh, or income gamble uh, risk tolerance. What it doesn't predict is actually the, um, uh, the incentive compatible, uh, compatible lotteries that are used uh, to elicit risk tolerance in, in economic experiments. So um, for whatever reason, we're not able to predict what, what is happening there. Um, we do predict, however, variation in, uh, in things like openness, extraversion, sensation-seeking, boredom susceptibility, uh, experience-seeking, behavioral disinhibition, and even ADHD symptoms. Um, we can also predict some risky behaviors, such as number of sexual partners or whether people ever used uh, cannabis. And by the way, so if uh, these... Um, these, uh, what is it, these striped bars, they indicate the predictive accuracy that we're getting from MTAC. Uh, so you see that across the various traits, typically the MTAC score does a little bit better, uh, which is uh, as, as it should be. Um, we can also predict some of the variation in whether people ever started a business or were an entrepreneur. Um, and, um, well, obviously also the, um, um, the uh, the additional um, supplementary phenotypes that we looked at in the UK Biobank, such as the first principal component of the risky behaviors. <coughs> 
So the bio annotation uh, of these GWAS results um, suggests that the uh, balance of uh, neurotransmission between glutamatergic and GABAergic <coughs> neurotransmission is actually important for risk tolerance. Again, we don't see any evidence in the bio annotation pointing to these uh, previous candidate uh, biological pathways. But we do pointers to specific um, areas of the brain, such as the basal ganglia, which has been known for a long time to be uh, um, involved in the, the reward system in humans uh, and uh, has been suspected to be involved in uh, decision-making under risk and uncertainty. The amygdala, which is um, partly responsible for emotional responses to the environment, such as fear and anxiety. And maybe a little bit more surprising, we also have pointers to the uh, frontal cortex, uh, which is responsible for a very wide variety of tasks and functions um, and has many dopamine receptors and is likely to be involved in dopam uh, dopaminergic pathways. So it may be that you know, indirectly we're actually do capturing something that has to do with, uh, with these dopaminergic pathways. And then probably the most surprising thing was the, the cerebellum, where um, neuroscientists typically ignore the cere cerebellum when they, when they study a higher order uh, functions. Um, but it turns out that our GWAS results point to that area of the brain. Um, I would take that with a, grain, with a little bit of grain of salt. So, you know, for various reasons, I wouldn't put too much emphasis on these uh, um, biological annotation results, but they're definitely intriguing. Exactly. Is what's been highlighted in neuroimaging studies yep. and decision making. In neuroeconomic often, there's a, yep. uh, that circuit often pops up, and many of these parts of the brain pop up as being very important for economic decision making. So we have, again, I don't want to push this too far because this is relatively preliminary biological results and uh, you know, early day GWAS, you guys may don't see anything. But still, it's interesting to see this convergent evidence between genetics and neuro neuroeconomics. Right. So um, just adding to that, so we, we recently had a conversation with uh, several neuroscientists and biologists about these results, and, and one of them said, well, okay, so if you find, uh, if you find GABA uh, and uh, glutamate, you basically find the brain, because that's, that's the main stuff that's going on in the brain. So, so he was like, <laughs> so that's okay, you have brain. <laughs> Right. So except EA, now EA3, except EA3 was still at such a big low power GWAS that everything popped out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, okay, so wrapping this up, so we, we found almost 900 loci across the seven phenotypes that we studied, and about a quarter of them, they were actually located in long range LD regions or in candidate inversions. Uh, so I actually think that this is also uh, kind of interesting and it, it, uh, it may suggest that, you know, our strategy currently, which only looks in, uh, at single nucleotide polymorphisms rather than structural variants, may actually miss an important part of the picture. So it could be that if we actually look at the structural variants that we, uh, that we would find uh, some of the missing heritability. Um, Clearly, this, the findings also suggest that there is a heritable general factor of risk-taking which cuts across domains. Um, and as we already discussed, so the bioinformatic analysis, they do point to specific areas in the brain to the balance of uh, excitatory and inhibitory neurotransmission. Uh, 
uh, whereas we found very little support for the candidate genes and, and pathways that the previous literature had identified. And of course, you can find the summer statistics and the FAQ on, uh, on our website. Yes? Um, not in this paper. I'm, uh, I'm going to show you some genomic SEM results uh, coming up. Yeah, 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 I totally agree. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, so this is actually, this is a perfect transition to the second project. So this is work in project, uh, progress. So this is what we call the externalizing consortium where uh, we're basically looking at a spectrum of behaviors, traits and disorders that are characterized by under controlled or impulsive actions. So in, in psychology, there is usually there is this big, um, uh, so sort of they're like these, these two major families of, uh, of disorders. One is externalizing, which is uh, all the things that we're looking at here, and the other one is internalizing, which includes things like, uh, like depression and neuroticism. So to the externalizing spectrum, people typically count things like ADHD, childhood conduct disorder, oppositional defiant disorder, antisocial behavior, but also uh, alcohol and other drug use disorders. Uh, but importantly, also all personality traits that are um, at least partially characterized by behavioral uh, disinhibition, such as risk tolerance or extraversion or sensation seeking. Okay? So what we know from the previous literature is that um, all dimensions of the spectrum are heritable. Uh, so this is from twin studies that, that obviously showed all of this stuff is heritable. But these twin studies also suggested already that this heritability is partly shared across the entire spectrum. So the hypothesis has been that uh, there may be, a, you know, there may be a, a common genetic architecture of uh, an externalizing factor that, uh, that is responsible for these both genetic and these phenotypic correlations. Until now, of course, nothing is really known about the molecular genetic architecture of, um, uh, of many of these traits and, and also of the uh, uh, potential latent factors obviously because we need uh, very large GWAS sample sizes for that, but now we can actually start doing that. Um, so the goals of the project are to use large-scale GWAS results of externalizing phenotypes to, uh, first of all, estimate the genetic correlations between these phenotypes from the GWAS summary statistics. And that's really cool because um, in, previous, uh, you know, in, in, in previous times where you only had the, the possibility to look either at phenotypic correlations or at genetic overlap on twin studies, you needed to measure all of these phenotypes in the same individuals. So uh, that actually hasn't ever been done like for the entire spectrum. So there's a lot of you know, question marks about how these things are actually hanging together. And with bivariate LD score regression, we can now actually look at all of that comprehensively. So that's pretty cool. Then we want to model the latent factor that drives the genetic correlations using genomic SEM and identify the genetic architecture of that latent uh, factor. And obviously we also want to uh, use the genetic correlations that we're observing to boost the, uh, the statistical power for genetic discovery of each of these phenotypes and thereby also get uh, better polygenic scores. So we expect that uh, we're going to have a, a combined sample of more than 1.2 million individuals in the end. And of course, we're going to make the GWAS summary statistics publicly available, both for each of the uh, phenotypes that go into the model, but also for the latent factor that we're, um, that we're identifying. And of course, we're again following a pre-registered analysis plan that you can find on the open science framework. Okay, so here is my externalizing team. Um, Richard going wild in a gun range in Texas. Travis having way too many drinks at BGA. And my lovely co-investigator is Paige Harden and, uh, and Danielle Dick. Okay, so currently we have a set of um, 11 phenotypes where we had both uh, well-powered GWAS summary statistics uh, in the public domain or where we could actually just obtain them ourselves. Uh, and the, yeah, so all of these phenotypes have been chosen both based on data availability, sample size, but also on theoretical grounds. So we have ADHD, age at uh, first sexual intercourse, alcohol dependence. Uh, so that's actually, that's a meta-analysis of uh, the PGC, the Million Veterans Program, and the GWAS that we ran ourselves on the Audit P score in the UK Biobank. Uh, automobile speeding and drinks per week are our own results from, uh, from the 2019 paper. Education attainment, this is uh, basically Lee et al. Um, I think we, we took out uh, the 23andMe results for logistic reasons. 
and a part of the UK Biobank that we're going to use for, for replication purposes. So this is why this is smaller than the, um, um, than the Lee et al. paper. Ever cannabis use is again a meta-analysis of the ICC uh, uh, paper by Stringer et al., 23andMe, and uh, UK Biobank. Then we ran GWAS on irritability in the UK Biobank. Uh, we used ever smoker and risk tolerance and number of sexual partner GWAS results from, uh, from our own 2019 paper. Yes? Yeah. Because, I mean, there's certain things like you talk about the experience and the benefit. Yeah. Now, obviously, that's highly scopely to satisfy yeah. the kind of this availability and benefit that they say. Yeah. And other kinds of factors. So, how exactly do you account for the fact that there's those factors that you look at? So, I mean, so the only thing that we can do here is uh, the standard thing that we always do in GWAS, which is basically trying to rule out population structures as much as possible by including, you know, principal components from the genetic data and by using mixed linear models. But you're totally right that it's quite possible that there is, you know, very subtle types of population structure, maybe even at the family level, that we may not get to with these uh, results. And actually, Part of our follow-up analysis is going to be based on samples of twins and, uh, and if, if we're lucky, also in samples of trios, where we hope to tease that apart exactly. So how much of it is actually biological and how much of it is, uh, you know, environmental, uh, environmental factors that are correlated with the genome for whatever reason, right? Uh, but at the GWAS discovery stage, you're totally right. We, we cannot be 100% sure that we actually disentangle these, uh, these things. Um, no, actually, uh, so this is, this is sort of interesting. So uh, education attainment actually is not considered as you know, part of the externalizing spectrum typically. However, the absence of education attainment uh, is, as you will see in a minute, is genetically very highly correlated with many of these, uh, ex um, uh, these externalizing phenotypes such as ADHD and uh, uh, you know, conduct disorder and, and so on and so forth. So it turns out by, by using education attainment in the model, we substantially boost statistical power because, you know, as you can see here, the sample size for education attainment just completely trumps all the other phenotypes by a far margin, right? So we're buying ourselves quite a bit of statistical power by doing that. But we're not controlling for it. Okay. I mean, it, it depends what you mean with the confounder, but I, I completely agree. So that's, uh, it's quite likely that if you study um, externalizing phenotypes, that uh, the environment, the family rearing environment, uh, parental role models, and so on and so forth, play a huge role. And uh, as I said, at the GWAS discovery stage, we're probably not going to be able to tease that apart. So we would, be, we, we would have to run within family GWAS, which of course is not possible in large samples. So the only thing we can get to that is with follow-up analysis. I mean, it's not perfect, but all these follow-up regression and drift tests does do an estimate of population structure. And based on the fact that it's not perfect, of course. It's right, not yeah. Better, but in practice, it does seem to get to... Well, a little bit, yeah. But I mean, so if I think probably education attainment is the strongest example where you see that uh, this doesn't capture uh, all the stratification that is going on. So for for education attainment, we also have, you know, uh, an intercept of LD score regression that is not really that far away from one. And yet, if you if you look at the Kong et al. paper, it seems like, you know, a very substantial part of the variation that we're picking up is actually within well, family transmission. Capture that type of right. Yeah. 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 Suppose we did uh, structural equation modeling at the discovery stage. Uh, I mean, maybe there's some equivalence results between doing it then and doing it later, but certainly for which, which if your genome line is significant, you would get different and possibly interesting results. So, so in this case, you want to know externalizing behavior that's not due to the ex educational attainment, for example, or, or to, to the same degree mm -hmm. of education attainment. You, you said that's obvious. I want to run the test for something else. Right. Yeah, so I, I think actually the, the most straightforward way to do that would be within genomic SEM. So you, would, uh, you could do a, like conditional GWAS analysis within genomic SEM where you say, okay, so what is the genetic architecture of, say, 
ADHD net of its overlap with education attainment, for example, right? So these things, they're, they're definitely possible with just with GWAS summary statistics. Okay, so here is a genetic correlation matrix between these 11 phenotypes. And um, as you see, there is a lot of genetic correlation going on, um, which is, you know, encouraging. And it's also sort of like what we expected. Uh, but it's definitely a good starting point for, for taking a multivariate approach to modeling this entire spectrum. Um, just two things that I wanted to point out here. So it turns out that education attainment um, is a very powerful proxy for ADHD and age at first sex. So, you know. But again, we can study education attainment in much larger samples, so by including it, we buy ourselves some power. Also interesting is that higher education attainment is genetically positively correlated with the number of drinks per week, but negatively with alcohol dependence. Uh, so that actually suggests that social drinking is, uh, is genetically not identical with, with actual alcohol abuse or you know, uh, AUD diagnosis, which is actually also something that, that uh, previous papers uh, showing uh, have also been shown. Yes. That's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. Did did your student look at uh, at heart booze as well? So I, I guess hard booze is like, you know, that, that gives you the most bang for the buck if you just <laughs> want to get there quickly, yeah. Okay. So a lot of these things are, are most of them, are self-reported, right? Yeah, so we yeah. Do we think that, you know, all these correlations with education attainment could be something about people just going to assess reports differently? How, how, how much of a do is this coming from? Right. Maybe so, that yeah, it's, it's, I, yeah, I mean, you're totally right. So most of these things, they are self-reported. Only some of them are actually based on clinical diagnosis. So some of it is, of course, is uh, case control cohort. So for example, um, alcohol dependence. Uh, so the PGC and the Million Veterans Program, there are two very large scale you know, case control cohorts uh, with clinical diagnosis. The same is true for ADHD, although that, that sample is not so large. But I totally take your point. So one of the reasons why we see these genetic correlations could very well be that there is you know, some sort of misreporting bias going on, which is consistent across phenotypes. So the way that we're going to deal with that is actually in the replication, the follow-up stage, where we're going to take polygenic scores uh, to actually try to predict uh, clinical outcomes and, and you know, actually observed behaviors rather than self-reports. And hopefully we're going to find that not, not all of it is driven by that, which I'm pretty sure we will find. But we cannot rule it out. Yeah. The other, the other thing you could do here is you could put a, a, ba a large number of self-reported traits, and well, and, uh, and then you categorize them by their social desirability. So yeah. you, you could, you could right. get independent judges yeah. for categorizing these by social desirability and try to see if you got a factor that, yeah. uh, that was like that. Yeah. And, and th there probably is. And, and you it could be. About how big it was. Yeah, it could be. So let me, let me show you our preliminary results from the multivariate uh, genomic SEM model. So we, uh, we were trying to fit um, several structural equation models with, within S, uh, genomic SEM. And the, uh, the model that had the best fit with the data is a bifactor model, which assumes that there is one broad factor uh, on which all of the items are loading. And then it allows for the presence of additional uh, specific factors. And all of these factors are assumed to be orthogonal to each other by construction. Okay? And this by factor model is actually um, you know, fitting our uh, data the best. If you look at it, um, the, uh, all of the phenotypes that we're fitting into the model, they're, they're loading on the broad externalizing factor the way that you would expect them to do. So that suggests that there actually is, you know, a, a general externalizing factor that, uh, um, that has a genetic architecture that, that cuts across various domains. Um, and the, the highest loadings that we observe here, uh, they actually come from sexual risk taking, from smoking, and from cannabis use. Then we find a second factor. Um, we call it here alcohol and tobacco, but honestly, I think it's, it's almost exclusively an alcohol factor. So uh, the, the alcohol phenotypes, so alcohol problems, but also number of drinks per week, they both load on the general externalizing factor, but they also load on this completely orthogonal additional factor. Uh, 
which suggests that you know, part of the genetic architecture of alcohol consumption is shared with other externalizing phenotypes, but there's clearly also a part that is clearly specific to, uh, to alcohol. The ever smoking um, only has a relatively small loading here. It's a 0.16 loading, whereas smoking actually loads very highly on the broad externalizing factor with uh, 0.73. And then there is a residual factor, which is a little tricky to interpret. We're, we're currently calling it socially stratified risk, which is, you know, getting into what, what you guys were suggesting already. So what this thing captures is primarily an absence of education attainment, which goes along with um, ADHD and um, age at first sex. Um, but it also goes along with a reduced risk for reckless driving, uh, a reduced risk for, for cannabis use, uh, lower general risk tolerance, and a lower number of sexual partners. So make of it whatever you want. <laughs> but that's what we find in our genomic SAM model at the moment. So the next steps are going to be, um, we're, we're going to actually increase the sample size for some of these phenotypes and then run a final uh, genomic SAM model. And uh, then we're going to get GWAS summary statistics using genomic SAM for all of these 11 phenotypes that we're feeding into it. Uh, so there is, we expect to get uh, quite a substantial boost in statistical power across these phenotypes. Um, and we're also going to be able to, uh, to get GWAS summary statistics for these latent factors. And then we can do, of course, a bunch of interesting follow-up analysis using polygenic scores and so on and so forth. Yes. Yeah. Um, it varies a bit, so most of them are actually very simple self-reports just based on, uh, on one question, so ever smoker or ever cannabis use, education attainment, automobile speed, and so these are all like one, one item things. So the latent factor for each of them are different. No, no, so the, the latent factor is this, right? So this is the genomic oh, SAM model, the, yes. Yeah. These, no, th these are the GWAS summary statistics uh, that, that we're feeding into the model, yeah. right? Yeah. And the latent, uh, the socially stratified risk, they are also um, consequences of the orthogonal? They're orthogonal by definition, yes. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's the assumption of the bi by factor model, that they're orthogonal to each other. Yeah. yeah. So basically, this thing here is sort of like it's a junk factor that picks up whatever, you know, we're not picking up with the, with the other two. Yeah. yeah. Sorry? The, the third factor, yeah, so the social strati socially stratified risk, so that's, yeah, that's capturing whatever we're not capturing with the other factors. And then, of course, there is some residual, you know, trait-specific variants that none of these three latent factors is picking up, so this is like these, these little arrows that you see here uh, bumbling around. Okay. Um, Few more words about the, uh, the brain anatomy and risk behavior. So this is, as I said, this is uh, work in progress that is trying to connect neuroscience with, uh, with genetics, where we're basically asking two questions. One is, are anatomical differences in specific brain regions associated with risk taking in real life? And then second, if that should be the case, do the genetic effects on risky behaviors predict differences in brain anatomy? So the first thing we're gonna do is, we're going to try to, to see if there is robust associations between features of brain anatomy and risky behaviors. And then we're going to see if any of these regions that are significantly associated with risky behaviors can be predicted by our polygenic score for the first principal component of risky behaviors. Again, shout out to my wonderful collaborator. So this is uh, Giddy at, at, uh, at Wharton and Remy. Did he ever show up here? He was supposed to come. Remy? No. Okay. So you didn't go. Very smart guy. A um, <laughs> little bit all over the place. And uh, Gucky, who is uh, um, taking primarily the lead on the neuroscientific analysis, and he's at uh, the University of Zurich. The data that we're using is UK Biobank data, uh, which, of course, as you all know, is not representative, but it's a much broader um, uh, you know, exposure of, of the entire population than most uh, neuroimaging studies. And the UK Biobank is currently co um, collecting brain scans on um, a huge number of people. So ultimately, they will, uh, they will have brain scans for 100,000 people. They're already at 20,000, which is absolutely phenomenal. I mean, it's uh, nothing like that has ever been done before. Um, so 
how, do, how does our study relate to previous work? Well, previous work was primarily done in, in lab experiments that were very small scale, so typically 100 people, hardly ever more than that. And of course, in the lab, they took convenience samples, mostly students that were performing um, you know, artificial tasks rather than actually looking what they do in the, in the wild, in the real world. And uh, primarily, uh, neuroscientists have looked at functional MRI, so we're looking at you know, activation patterns in the brain rather than anatomical differences in brain structure and volume. So our contribution is gonna be, uh, you know, it's the largest study to date, um, like orders of magnitude larger than what has been done uh, previously. We actually process the brain images ourselves to get better resolution than what is provided by the UK Biobank. Because it's a population sample, um, uh, with you know, measures of real life risk taking and the, a lot of other phenotypes, we can also um, actually control much more rigorously for potential confounds than is typically done in the neuroscientific literature. So uh, one thing that is actually never done in neuroscience is to control for population structure, although that is obviously a problem there as well. And so we can do that with our standard uh, you know, 40 principal components. And then obviously we control for birth year dummies, sex, their interactions, height, handedness, total intracranial volume. And again, following a pre-registered analysis plan. What's that? Um, because we didn't want to calculate everything from scratch and, you know, uh, yeah. We, we could just as well run PCA and include 500. It doesn't really matter. It's like, you know, the, the differences are really, really marginal. Once you throw in five or six, it mm -hmm, yeah, doesn't really make much of a difference anymore at that point. <laughs> we just took what, uh, what is available. Um, the outcome is this first principal component of risk tolerance that I mentioned, which we also studied in the risk preference GWAS. And here are the factor loadings uh, on, the, on the principal component. So it's drinking, smoking, speeding, and sexual behavior. Um, so as I said, we process the data ourselves, which means that we, uh, we also have voxel level gray matter and white matter volume. So not only at the level of uh, regions of interest, but actually at the voxel uh, level. And then we use the permutation test to work out just how many independent hypotheses are we really testing with that, uh, uh, with that large amount of data that we're having at our hands. And the Bonferroni adjusted p-value is then something like 7 times 10 to the power of minus 7. Okay, so this is, these are the results that we find in a sample that excludes heavy drinkers. I will show you in a minute why we exclude heavy drinkers. So what we see here um, are basically... Um, Associations that survive Bonferroni correction, um, and all of these associations uh, are negative, meaning that reductions in gray matter volume in these indicated regions are associated with more risk-taking. And um, the regions that we're pointing to belong primarily to the reward network, um, so the ventral med uh, medial prefrontal cortex, the posterior cingulate uh, cortex, and the ventral uh, striatum. Um, which is sort of what has been already suggested by, by previous fMRI studies. <laughs> what is not so well known until now is the involvement of the uh, frontoparietal executive control network. So there in particular, we have pointers to the inferior frontal sulcus, the anterior insula, and the posterior parietal cortex. So this is a sample um, excluding heavy drinkers, almost 30, 000, uh, 13,000 individuals. Now I'm gonna show you what the contrast looks like if we do include the heavy drinkers. So people that, you know, we excluded here in this one, women that had more than 18 drinks per week and, uh, and men that have more than 24 drinks per week, you would be shocked how many people in the UK actually meet that definition. <laughs> um, and here is what we get when we include them. So then basically you have much stronger association signal and it's basically all of the brain. And again, all of these associations are negative, meaning that reductions in gray matter volume are associated with more risky behavior. So this raises the question, um, you know, what is the egg and what is the chicken? Uh, so is it, you know, is, is it differences in brain anatomy that make you behave different? Or is it your risky behavior which then actually influences your brain? So this is another project that we're currently working on, uh, which uses several approaches to try to tease out that, that causal pathway, including various versions of Mendelian randomization and longitudinal approaches and so on and so forth. And it seems to be the case that at least for heavy drinking, um, that it actually causes brain damage. So that it literally leads to a, a reduction of gray matter volume. And basically it destroys neurons and they're not growing back. 
So next time you go out and have a really good time, maybe keep that in mind. Um, okay, now back to the, uh, um, to the sample without the, the heavy drinkers. So now we're trying to see if a polygenic score for these risky behaviors is actually predicting differences in gray matter volume in these regions that we found to be associated with risky behaviors. So we constructed the polygenic score by rerunning the GWAS in the UK Biobank on that first principal component, excluding people with brain scans and all their relatives. So we, we do clean out of sample prediction. Our polygenic score um, captures 2.9% of the variation in that first principal component of risky behaviors, which is not bad and about 0.8% of the variation in number of drinks per week, which is pretty spectacular because that's also what uh, you know, the G-Scan consortium uh, did in their paper, which is based on almost three times as many individuals as we had uh, here for this first principal component. And clearly you see that there are some regions popping up um, that our polygenic score can predict. And um, in particular, in the left and in the middle, you see pointers again to the reward sy uh, system, so the, the dorsal striatum, including the putamen. And on the right, you have this, uh, this pointer to the executive control network, uh, including the inferior frontal sulcus. So that's actually pretty cool, also because very little is known about the genetic architecture of these brain regions until now. So, you know, by using a polygenic score for, ris uh, for risky behaviors, we actually learn something about the genetic architecture of these specific features of brain anatomy, which I think is actually pretty cool. Did this make any sense? Is there a regression of box score of area level in the amount of volume on the polygenic score? That's correct. And is, there, and is that correct thing for multiplied by the inferior? Yes. 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 Okay, so these are the things you have to say. Yeah. How many are these voxel level or how many are So what we did is we, um, uh, so the original analysis that I showed you here, this is voxel level. And then for the polygenic scores, we're basically, uh, um, we, were, uh, we were looking at the regions of interest that were implicated by these voxel level results, and then we were using the region of interest like aggregate variation and, and gray matter volume. And when you do a formal mediation model where you see uh, like how much of the uh, you know, uh, polygenic risk score for risky behaviors is mediated by these three features of brain anatomy, we do see that you know, that there are some, you know, that the indirect path, they are statistically significant. Um, they're, they're picking up a relatively small share of the overall um, covariance between the score and the risky behaviors. But each of them is, you know, independently um, significant. And what happens is that the polygenic score predicts lower gray matter volume in these implied regions. And then the lower gray matter volume is associated with, um, with an increase in, in risky behaviors. Of course, don't let yourself be fooled here by the, by the errors. So the, the, the errors do not actually uh, suggest causality. So these are just how we set up the, uh, the mediation model. These are not actually causal estimates. Okay. All right, um, so in this project, we uh, find support for se several previously identified fMRI regions, including the amygdala, the anterior insula, and the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. We also see new pointers uh, to uh, um, areas of the brain that are not known very much to be uh, you know, important for risky behaviors, such as the thalamus, the hippocampus, the putamen, the inferior frontal sulcus, and the planum temporale. And we do see that our genetic risk score actually partly um, predicts some of these um, differences in gray matter volume, in particular in the dorsal striatum and the inferior frontal sulcus. Okay, so I'm wrapping it up. So um, what I tried to get across to you guys is that there are a lot of advantages to taking a multivariate approach to genetic uh, discovery. Um, and also, we see that risk tolerance is actually, um, first of all, there is you know, various forms of, of risk tolerance or risky behaviors, and they all seem to have a shared genetic component, which seems to belong to an even greater, um, wider spectrum that psychologists call the externalizing spectrum. And what this implies is actually, this is pretty cool, is that, um, normal range behaviors, uh, they can be informative about the genetic architecture of much more extreme clinical outcomes. So we see that clearly in our externalizing project. Okay, I'm gonna leave it here. <laughs>
Yeah, that's, I mean, okay, so we know that phenotypically there are changes over age. So, d you know, um, there, there's clear age patterns that, that actually correlate with sexual maturity, with, uh, you know, with, uh, with puberty and then later um, you know, with menopause and so on and so forth. So you, you, you clearly see changes in, in, you know, how much risk people are willing to take over the life cycle and they're sex specific. Um, there's also clearly differences across cultures. Um, so these things, they're, they're, they're clearly not carved into stone. Um, I think what we're picking up on here is a part of the genetic variants um, or a part of the genetic factors that, that seem to cut across not only different domains but probably also different stages of life. So I think what we're picking up on is something that, that is probably relatively person specific and that does not change that much, although there can be quite a lot of fluctuation around that, you know, that fixed point uh, over life course. But I think it's, it's definitely, it's a super interesting question. So there's, mm -hmm. there's probably a lot of uh, follow up work that, that people can do once, you know, these, these genetic results are in the public domain and they're, you know, when, when you then have longitudinal data, particularly, if, you know, from, fam from family samples where you can look at development within family and, and use genetic predictors. That may be pretty uh, pretty cool to see how that unfolds. I'm not sure if that answers your question. No, I don't. I don't think it does that much. I mean, um, if if you just look at the phenotypes that that we're looking at, I mean, first of all, they're um, the phenotypes that were collected and people at very different age ranges, right? Um, and, they, uh, and they do capture various types of behaviors or outcomes that you would typically observe in different, you know, where you would ac expect to see some sort of variation across the lifespan. Um, and yet what we're picking up on is genetic signal that, that seems to be predictive out of sample and, you know, that seems to suggest that, you know, it's not just noise, there's something real going on which is person-specific and linked to, uh, to genetic influences. Yeah. So I mean, so the, you you see that in the in the phenotypic data. So typically, um, especially for people like from from the beginning of puberty until like the early forties, uh, you know, mid forties, you see that uh, that females are much less risk taking than males. Um, and of course, I mean, yeah. Well, if, if you ever had contact with a teenage boy, you will exactly know what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Actually, so this is this is one interesting thing I didn't mention, but we we did look at the genetic correlation um, for risk tolerance between males and females. Um, so obviously, the question was, you know, is the genetic architecture for risk tolerance exactly the same for males and females? It actually isn't. So the genetic uh, correlation is uh, is different from one. I think it was in the range of 80, 83, 85, something like that. So definitely enough to meta-analyze, but you know, there's also apparently a sex-specific component, even given the fact that we only looked at the autosomes, we didn't even look at the sex chromosome in our study. Yeah. Uh, I have two questions. One is that, did you construct uh, the working by gender? I yeah, we did, yes, yes. So at least in the UK Biobank, we could do that. Um, I'm, I don't really remember in how many other studies we could do that, but at least in the UK Biobank, th there was enough data for us to do a well-powered GWAS, you know, both for females and males, and at least to look at the genetic correlation between them. Yeah, no, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Maybe. 
Yeah. Yeah. Can you keep the cat free in front of the cat free? Right. I mean, honestly, I, I sort of expect that when, uh, when, we, uh, when we start looking at you know, how predictive the polygenic scores for these latent factors are within family, I sort of expect that you know, a, to find quite a bit of genetic nurture. So I would absolutely not be surprised if you know, parental role modeling plays a big role for you know, not, not only the, the socially stratified risk, but just you know, generally how, you know, how likely is it that the, that the child will start you know, developing some sort of uh, behavioral problem, aggression, um, you know, start taking drugs, whatever. Yeah. Right. But if you do, if you do the three, the first to start to find, might be picking up a lot of Maybe. It, the yeah. Yes, and then they didn't have a cleaner semi. So it'll be interesting to see right. who could do the polygenic score right. to find some yeah. of Yeah, I mean, I've, at this point, we don't know yet how predictive these polygenic scores are actually going to be and you know whether, whether our within-family samples are going to be large enough to actually uh, see significant differences. <laughs> um, but I'm with you. I mean, this, these are interesting questions. It would be cool to know. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Size, yep. Probably is about an, a noisy, in some sense, a noisier phenotype. Oh yeah. But how? And this is a, a good question for everybody. Um, can we can we predict how predictive the PCS will be a few years from now? Mm. So let's say you bring in the Stonia mm -hmm. and all of us, and, right. and hopefully they would. Have Let me see. Yeah. Risk tolerance question. What right. Right. So um, we we did look at the uh, heritability of these um, uh, of these traits in uh, in Jonathan's risk tolerance paper. So we basically computed the uh, the SNP based heritability using three different ma uh, methods of so LD score regression, uh, HAS, and GCTA. And what we found is that you know for this very simple measure of you know are you are you likely to take risk yes or no so we find a heritability that is not high it's like five to you know eight percent something like that, uh, which quite likely reflects the, the you know the fact that this is an extremely noisy measure and of course you know phenotypic noise attenuates your your uh, um, your heritability estimate. If you compare that to the heritability estimate that we find for the first principal component of the risky behaviors, that's actually much higher. So it's more like in the range of 10 to 15 percent. That's the intuitable and, and, and A squared concept is correct for phenotypic noise. So especially something like that, that question, you can get a lower bound on phenotypic noise by looking at the test we test for life. Right, 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 exactly. It could yes. be correct for at least that much. There's right. There's more noise than that, but there's at least yeah. that much. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Jonathan has done that in, in a paper using SNAP in Instagrams in America. What do you find for the heritability in SNP? Can't you adjust for measuring that? For risk, it's around 10 to 15, 10 to 15 percent. I would say particularly in Peru. Um, yeah. 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 I mean, under some, the, the model correct for measurement error is based on some assumptions, but right. uh, that, that is a useful, I mean, it is a model for measurement error. I mean, it in a projection, you need the uh, if the ratio of signal to uh, phenotype. Basically, the, the the phenotype, the phenotypic measure, just explains the equation. Thirty percent of the variation in risk, and your heritability is thirty-one percent. Then a perfect score would explain thirty-one percent of your heritability mm -hmm. and thirty percent. So yeah, so it's. But I don't think the heritability. I don't think we're in that world. I think for risk tolerance, the heritability is probably lower. on the gender uh, result that you mentioned. There's like this huge debate, right? Like it's how much of it is social, like yeah. difference in gender yeah. by of risk taking. Yeah. Do you think your results tell you anything about it? 
I don't know. Um, right, I mean, so these the, this imperfect genetic correlations uh, uh, between males and females, uh, it may very well be be driven by by social factors, right? right? So if I I don't think we uh, we can take are a very strong are point. Are you to no. Uh, inform us about that question? No. Mm -hmm. we just yeah. There are ways. Okay, it could be it could be it could be social factors. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. All right.